next guest is a Vietnam veteran and a comedian, but not necessarily in that order. I figured it would be appropriate to introduce him, so I, uh, I asked uh, about some wartime humor. I started asking vets that I know, what was funny in Vietnam? The silence was deafening. They told me that a lot of funny things happened, but you had to be there to understand them. Besides, being funny was always secondary to knowing how to duck fast. Since I don't make my living telling jokes, and he does, I'm going to give him out right now, ladies and gentlemen, Blake Clark. I'm a Vietnam vet. Thank you. I was, uh, I was born and raised in Georgia, and I fought in Vietnam. That's kind of like being punished for the same thing twice. In fact, I used to have flashbacks in Vietnam of Georgia. <laughs> As you people well know, it's, it's not easy being a Vietnam vet. Even in 1987, even in the PR era, post Rambo. Uh, I read this. I read this in the paper. Rambo 3 is already in production. Boy, have my prayers been answered. The article. The article went on to say that the plot would not be divulged. <laughs> I don't think it'll be divulged during the movie. Okay. I saw. <laughs> I saw uh, Rambo, First Blood 2, whatever it was called. Probably the most realistic war movie I've ever seen. They got Rambo, he goes to Vietnam, he's there, oh, 36 hours, kills 200,000 Vietnamese. I guess it was a slow day, huh? Shows him running through rice paddies like O.J. Simpson and Eric Dickerson on AstroTurf. You don't run through rice paddies like that. You run through rice paddies like this. <laughs> It would have taken Rambo five years to run through that many rice paddies. Mortar rounds are bursting like 10 feet from him. He just runs around them. <laughs> Why didn't we think of that, guys, huh? <laughs> so much easier than jumping down and getting all dirty and all that stuff, isn't it? As all these men here know, the bursting radius of an 82-millimeter mortar is not 10 feet, it's 160 feet. We know this because we were on the receiving end of a few of those things. But they also taught us this in training, remember? We'd have these drill sergeants that come out and go, Gentlemen, pay close attention to this. It could save your life in Vietnam. The bursting radius of an 82-millimeter mortar is 160 feet to fire, 23-pound projectile inside, it's 23-pound projectile, it's 5-pound center core, comes in via pass, explodes, explodes at 23,000 feet per second. Around is a 1,000 meters, it's one water segment in every centimeter, around is a hard steel casing. When this round bursts for 160 feet in every direction, 100,000 of pieces of metal, we call shrapnel traveling. At 23,000 feet per second, we'll kill or injure anything within that zone. Except Rambo. <laughs> and then, and then Rambo steals this chopper that just happens to be sitting out in the jungle, been sitting out there, oh, 15 years. No spare parts, naturally, it works perfectly. Yeah. He throws the POWs in the back and takes off. <laughs> then this Russian pilot, probably an Afghan vet, this Russian pilot starts chasing him. Something that looks like a TIE fighter left over from Star Wars. Shooting heat-seeking missiles at him can't hit him. A heat-seeking missile will find your butt five miles away if you had Mexican food, but he can't hit Rambo right in front of him. Yeah, I'm stupid as me. <laughs> then... Then there's a big explosion on the screen, which is supposed to make everybody think, oh, wow, Rambo's dead. And then, and then the, ch the Russian pilot lands his chopper right in front of Rambo's chopper, not off to the side where it would be safe. Never occurs to him to fly by and strafe him. No, he lands his chopper right in front of him. So I figure, okay, Rambo's going to shoot a rocket from his rocket pod, blow this guy up. Not likely, but it could happen. But not Rambo, no. He whips out a law, a light anti-tank weapon. 
like the old World War II bazookas and fires it through the broken plexiglass window. <laughs> Blows this guy. Everybody in the theater is going, all right, Rambo, yeah, yeah. Now the back blast on one of these things is 67 feet. Nobody's even thinking of these POWs sitting directly behind him. <laughs> Like most of you here, I was drafted. Like most of you, when I got my draft notice, <laughs> I went. <laughs> a lot of my friends chose to go ROTC, which is run over to Canada, but I didn't do that. Say, I thought there were laws and rules. <laughs> I was in the Army, which is kind of like the Boy Scouts, only the Boy Scouts have adult leadership. <laughs> I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for my basic training. All right, Fort Dingaling. <laughs> now they told us stuff in training that just didn't make sense, right? They treated everybody in the service, no matter where you were from. Now I'm from the South, so I'm used to being treated like I'm stupid. But they treated everybody in the Army like you were stupid. They would do stuff like bayonet training. Remember that, guys? We'd be out there with the little bayonets on our, on our M16s, and they'd say stuff like, gentlemen, if you're fighting the North Vietnamese and you stab him in the chest with your bayonet, your bayonet becomes lodged in his rib cage. You can't extract it. Simply fire a round from your weapon. You can extract the bayonet. And I'm thinking, if there are rounds in my weapon, there ain't gonna be no goddamn bayonet fighting. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> bayonet fighting comes a little later in the program, right? In my case, bayonet fighting came after this. Ah! Because I was in the infantry, and the motto of the infantry was, follow me. I changed all that to, after you. Go ahead, go ahead. My unit, we never went on search and destroy missions. We went on search and avoid missions, OK? <laughs> the enemy's over there, we went that way. I was an officer. I was a lieutenant. It's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm reformed now, though, OK? That's all right. I've been to the Schick Center for officers. I haven't given an order in, I don't know, 15 years, and it feels good. But I was drafted, I went to OCS, and they would, they would teach us other things, like in OCS, they would teach us other things. One of the things, that I, you know, they would yell stuff at us when we were doing the training. For those of you who, for those of you who aren't, uh, never were in the service, they'd yell stuff at us, like, what are the only two kind of people on a battlefield, remember that? We were supposed to yell back, the quick and the dead, drill sergeant. They singled me out. They said, what are the only two kind of people on the battlefield? I looked around. I said, minorities and the poor, drill sergeant. <laughs> Point I'm trying to make. <laughs> Point I'm trying to make. There weren't too many senators' sons over there is what I'm trying to make. <laughs> but I was always, I was always in trouble, even in, over in Vietnam. And of course, when we got there, they treated us like we were stupid. Now, you don't have to be a Vietnam vet to know how a hand grenade works, right? It's a very simple process. But in Vietnam, in combat, printed on the hand grenades, it said, pull pin, throw away. <laughs> like some guy's gonna go, oh, hell, I'll keep this one right here, huh? <laughs> and then you remember the Claymore mines? Yeah, we had these, right, these anti-personnel Claymore mines. They were command detonated. They blew steel balls out one direction. Guys were always getting them turned around the wrong way and parting the hair in 15 or 20 different places. So the army, to alleviate this, they put front on the front. But this wasn't enough for the army. They felt like they had to further explain that. It said front toward enemy. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I got it now. I, got, I understand. I understand. On the back, on the back, it had do not eat. on the back of a landmine. Now, I'm no Rhodes Scholar, but I pretty well figured out on my own, you don't eat landmines. I figured that out. <laughs> having, having had to eat sea rations for a year, I could understand why someone would be tempted to eat a landmine, though, because sea rations didn't come from any of the five basic food groups. And the worst was the coffee. Remember that? It came in these little packets. Well, we'd drink it because we didn't have anything else to stay awake over there. Now, we were on the Laotian border in 1971, and stuff was happening every day then. Our pucker factors were like that. You couldn't pull a needle out of our butts with a tractor, okay? We were scared. And I was out front, I'd had like 15 cups of that coffee, and I had my M16 out there, and I was wired, man. I was 
I heard a twig snap behind me and went, Chief! It was Robert Young. He said, Blake, why so tense? And <laughs> I want to show you this before I go. This is a T-shirt. This is basically for you people at home with a, with a contribution of $25 or more. The key word being or more. You can get one of these T-shirts. And I guarantee you, you'll look better than it than I do, okay? This part of it isn't included. This part of it is mine. Is mine. But I just want to say to you folks at home, okay? This is a welcome home concert. There are Vietnam veterans right here. This is not about Vietnam. This isn't about Democrats or Republicans. This isn't even about these great and wonderful stars who have given of their time. It's about these people right here and these people right here. Send money. 1-800-USA-1987. Welcome home, brothers. <laughs>